We're very pleased at the David M. Kennedy Center for, for International Studies to welcome Dodge Billingsley. Uh, Mr. Billingsley began covering war in 1993, eventually founding Combat Re Films and Research in 1997. He spent much of his time documenting numerous global hotspots, including Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Chechnya, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Western China, and Iraq, splitting his time between producing documentaries, writing, and lecturing. Beyond the Border, uh, of which uh, Global Car is, is one part, is a series of six films of international scope that he's produced for the, for the Kennedy Center. Uh, they began airing in fall 2004 and spring 2005. You can find out more information about the other films in the series at beyondtheborder.org. In 2003, uh, Dodge was a finalist for the prestigious Rory Beck Peck Award for Best Feature for his film Virgin Soldiers, which follows a squad of Marines from their base in Southern California to the end of combat operations in Baghdad. In 2002, his film House of War won the Rory Peck Award and the Royal Television Society Award for Best Feature, battle, uh, documenting the battle for Kuala Jangi Fortress in Afghanistan, where he was one of the few foreigners on hand at the prison revolt that took the life of CIA agent Mike Spann. Months later, he was among the few to document the U.S.-led Operation Anaconda in Afghanistan's Shah Ikat Valley, air assaulting into the valley with soldiers from the 101st Air, air Assault Division. He's currently writing a book and documentary on the operation commissioned by the U.S. Army's Foreign Military Studies Office. Um, Dodge Billingsley also co-wrote, produced, and directed Immortal Fortress, a look inside Chechnya's warrior culture, a film that took him deep into the dangerous, war-torn breakaway regions of Chechnya to document the insurgent perspective. And prior to that, he produced numerous programs for the Discovery and History channels that explored weapons and the changing nature of warfare. Um, there's many, many other things I could say about Dodge. Um, he received a bachelor's degree from Columbia and a master's degree from King's College. He's lectured at numerous uh, institutes, universities, and consults regularly for uh, U.S. government. Um, he's a contributor to a wide range of defense and security-related security, re security related journals, including Jane's Intelligence Review, the Journal of Electronic Defense, and Harriman Review. Um, Today he will be speaking on the making of Global Car, the director's perspective. Please join me in welcoming Dodge Billingsley. It is good to be back at the Kennedy Center. I think I say that every semester, but it really is. I enjoy coming down here. Um, this is interesting for me to talk about Global Car because it's so much a collaborative effort um, between myself and uh, Jeff Ringer, Corey, Eric Heyer, Christy Seawright, and other personalities and other uh, people here on campus. But I want to sort of take you through the process of how we came to visualize the concept behind this film, and, um, and we can go down two tracks. And, and I'll try to talk for or speak for about half the time, and if there's questions, because I realize this is a film, so it's a study, but it's also a film. So there's the actual contextual element of the project, which is what is globalization, the global car, and there's also the process of making the film. So you kind of have two things we could talk about. But I just want to go through, and I will share a little bit, um, a few slides. I don't have too many, and I'll show you a trailer at the end as well. But um, it's been a long and incredibly interesting process for us. The, the Corey Leonard, I would say, actually from my perspective, he might disagree, was the uh, driving force behind coming up behind this film. He wanted to do something on globalization. But it, it, as we sat around the table and we started thinking about projects, it was actually in, uh, I think one day, I think Eric Heyer was the first one to, to visualize or to verbalize what would become the film's core through line. And that basically is a look at the automobile supply chains taking one car and looking at all its parts from around the world, following those parts into the auto manufacturer point of assembly and putting that car together. <clears throat> and I would really like that idea a lot and begin to develop the concept further to examine supply chains and the global network of parts that make up what we thought would be the quintessential American vehicle, the pickup truck. Um, we also thought it would be nice to, at the same time, juxtapose that with a, a foreign car, however, assembled in the United States, like the Camry or the Honda Odyssey, one of those vehicles from Honda or Toyota. Um, there's been a lot of debate over foreign content in automobiles here in the United States. In 1992, Congress required domestic content labels to actually be put on every car. But in our discussions with uh, experts around the industry, they sort of feel like that's a joke because it's so complicated, the supply chains, that it's really difficult to actually say what, because even a part that's made in America comes, is comprised of 40 parts that come from 20 different places around the world. 
So it's really kind of tricky. But when we started, we initially went to work down three tracks. The first was to get up to speed on the topic. I mean, we really had to start understanding what this, what this uh, automobile supply chains are all about and also what globalization was all about in that context. Uh, we had a lot of material to digest, um, but we wanted to be up on the data and up on current trends as well so that we didn't come out as being naive or single-minded in the film. Our second track was to get a hold of the car companies themselves and elicit information and, and to access if we, how much access we'd be granted. Um, our primary researcher was actually Ty Turley, who is a BYU graduate who's now doing a PhD in economics at the University of Chicago. He was excellent at, at finding out information and digesting data quickly and allowed us to move through our, uh, our research phase in just a couple of months. I should say that, say that we actually started this film, it says 2005, it was early 2005, I think when we actually started sitting down having worked out a tentative time schedule. And I'll tell you, the time frame was not five years, so for you, which I'll talk about. Um, it was supposed to be a year project. <clears throat> but there's a, there's a silver line to that. Um, but again, we also want to talk to the car company people themselves. Uh, in addition to that, we want to talk to the experts who could tell the story from outside the car companies, in maybe a non-institutional view of the story. You know, we've been doing these kind of films and research projects long enough that we know that if you have a company person talk about something, they're going to give you a company agenda and talk about company issues in that from that perspective. And that's that's just the way it is, and we all do that. But so we wanted to have an outside expert base, an inside the industry base, and then academics if we could. Uh, Christy Seawright from the Marriott School was also very helpful to our early research efforts, helping us to shape the argument and the storyline. Um, so getting started, we first went to Ford and Toyota. Within a week, so we realized that this would not be the film we wanted it to be. Ford rejected our requests outright. Um, there was absolutely no interest in talking about globalization and how it related or is being carried out within the car industry, specifically within Ford itself. Why? Because we were soon to find out, and I guess we probably should have figured this out beforehand, but globalization and many of its characteristics, offshoring, outsourcing, developing nation labor cost versus developed nation labor cost, were all very politically sensitive issues with immediate winners and losers. One can say that what they want, but let me give you an example. We often heard, for instance, as justification for moving jobs to lesser developed countries that the U.S. or these Western European countries might become sort of these training facilities or high-tech centers while India and China would then take over global manufacturing, the low end versus the high end. But these are real job trends that impact millions of people on both sides. Brian Yates, in fact, at Burke said this exact thing. You know, he could see that his market share was being eroded. And he basically said, um, you know, we see ourselves as a center of excellence, which will go out and teach the Indians and the Chinese and, the, you know, people in that part of the world, Mexico perhaps, to do these things. But almost on the flip side, he realized that once you teach them how to do it, they can then take the, they can then take the business and move it right offshore or right out of the country. Um, so it was kind of an interesting sort of back and forth we got from most of the people we talked to. There was also one of the perception, especially when it came to Ford. Ford was producing the F-150 truck. It's the best-selling truck in America under the perception that it was American-built for Americans. You may remember or recall the advertising campaigns. That's been one of the cornerstones of Ford's ad campaigns for a long time, American-built. Um, <clears throat> as a result, you know, and this appeals to a large demographic in America, including my father, who has driven nothing but Ford trucks and thinks that they're completely made in America, and that's fine. But the fact is they aren't. But either way, Ford didn't really want to work with us on this foreign content issue. Uh, so we got nowhere with Ford, and we also made no progress with Toyota as well for similar reasons. There's no real interest in pointing out that the Camry, for instance, the best-selling car in America for years, was, although assembled in the U.S., was also made from parts from all over the world, or to highlight the profits from Toyota trucks, which Toyota was pushing directly against the big three in America for truck market share, all those profits returned home to its corporate uh, Toyota Corporation in Japan. And I don't know if you recall this, but Toyota was pushing to move a truck plant in 2005 into Texas. In Texas, they sell more trucks. Texas, the state of Texas buys more trucks than all other states in the country combined, year in, year out. 
So if you can win Texas, you win the market share of truck sales in, the, in America. So they went head-to-head -head with Ford and GM there by putting a huge plant outside of San Antonio. And in fact, they offered the government all kinds of incentives, and the government offered them all kinds of incentives, and what happened was the San Antonio started driving around in Toyota, all their like meter guys and everything, dropped their uh, the big three four, uh, truck commitments and now uses Toyota trucks. Um, <clears throat> but they were not interested in talking to us at all. So for a while, it looked like we were going to have to rewrite our story, or maybe we weren't even going to have a story. I don't know. It was looking pretty thin. Um, but we were working with multiple companies and, um, and experts to sort of like see what we could find. And we came up, we gained some traction with a handful of companies in England, Singapore, India, and eventually the U.S., and with Daimler Chrysler. The exact breakthrough came actually with a radiator cap supplier in India that was willing to work with us. In fact, in a it was a complete mood switch from the U.S. companies because, uh, in fact, this radiator company called Sundrum Fasteners, located in Chennai, India, was very proud of its success as a global supplier. They actually wanted to let the world know this is what we're doing. You know, their goal was to produce 100 million radiator caps a year, and you think, okay, it's just a radiator cap. But they supplied all radiator caps for GM. I mean, every GM cap in North America came from Chennai, India. Just an example of this... Uh, of the globalization of the industry and how these parts come in. Uh, Daimler Chrysler, um, they were, had many, many clients around the world, but they were very, very happy again to, uh, to tell their story. And this led us to dovetail our research to focus on Sundrum because, frankly, it was the first company that actually opened their doors to us. So we finally had somebody we could go look at. Um, <clears throat> So we set out, as we set out to flush the system, to flush out the story, we also were able to talk to them and figure out who their suppliers were below them, who supplied to them, and who they supplied to. They were fairly open about that stuff. Um, and it turns out that the biggest ones, like you say, in the U.S. were GM and Chrysler, the biggest auto manufacturers. So we started with Chrysler and then concurrently started researching down the supply chain to see who their, their supply, the people who supplied them. I'm going to show a little graphic See if I can do this right. Transform goods one step at a time. The end products then make their way to the auto manufacturers themselves. Now this is just a simple graphic, and it's basically a supply chain. You have the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer. In this case, it's Daimler Chrysler, but it could be Ford, Honda, Toyota, whoever is the automobile manufacturer. And this is the supply chain. This is the actual supply chain for a radiator cap. The steel comes, the steel part of the radiator cap, not the rubber part. It has its own supply chain. Tyson Krupp in Germany provides the sheet, the, the rolled steel to Burke in England. Burke makes out of that little widgets. They send them to Sundrum in India. India actually manufactures the cap with multiple parts. They send them to Modine in Clinton, Tennessee before it finally ends up on the, and you might think this is ridiculous because this is just a radiator cap. Why can't they be making these in one location? And, I mean, that's the whole issue that we've been talking about. But that's a typical supply chain. Some supply chains would be up to 12 or 13 tiers, while others might be two or three. <clears throat> but Sundrum, Sundrum really helped us. And this is Prem, the uh, director of Sundrum Fasteners, because, again, they gave us basically information that all the other companies were treating propri as proprietary information. They just didn't want to share it. It was like dealing with people that had what they considered classified information. Also, we know that it was politically sensitive, and so we just couldn't get anybody to open up to us. I mean, there were, like National Geographic, while we were doing this, came up with a uh, feature on the, the BMW Mini Cooper, and they showed some of the supply chains for that. But it wasn't a comprehensive, here, is, here are all the parts supply chains for the Mini Cooper. It was a nice little spread, but it was just kind of like their own investigative journalism that found that supply chain and put it out there. It just, uh, this just wasn't sitting out there for people to find, to, uh, to see easily. Um, but basically, again, in the summer of 2005, we actually sent Ty Turley over to India, and what we had done to save money on the budget was we hired an Indian camera crew. Ty Turley met the camera crew there, and he started filming in the first two interviews with Prem and a worker named Boniface. We then went off to, um, to Burke, to the UK, to meet with an interview. Burke Limited, which produced, like I just mentioned, the steel, and PCR, which is precision cut rubber. And both were fairly frank with us about losing market share, mostly off camera, though, never on camera. They were really afraid to talk about this stuff on camera. But they had said tremendous amounts of their business went away, have been going away. 
both talked about moving factories to Eastern Europe to take advantage of lower labor costs, all basically part of an effort to stay competitive with the startups that, are ha that were working out of the developing world, i.e. Sundrum fasteners in, um, in India. They were also very, one of their other strategies was to develop new technologies as a way to stay in the game. The end result, though, again, was that lobs, jobs were still being lost, not necessarily to offshoring, but to automation and higher technology applications, so that it could, if it took five people to do this particular job, now it took a robot and one person. And so four jobs were lost. But that was the only way they could, in the longer term, they felt, stay competitive with someone like with the country, uh, companies in India, China, these Mexico, where labor rates were so much lower. Um, what was interesting is they were talking about this uh, high-tech approach. So many of the jobs you noticed specifically at Precision Cut Rubber were very menial. I mean, honestly, I could get my 14-year-old you know, 14 -year -old cousin to do the jobs of three or four people I saw in there. I mean, it was really menial labor. And, and I remember we left, Ty Turley and I, we left, we're going, man, I mean, how long can they possibly last? Because that is a job that can totally go overseas. They only had one application out of four parts they made that re required this high-tech labor. The rest were, were things that anybody could do without any real training. And so it was kind of, it sort of saw the writing on the wall that these jobs would be pushed overseas eventually. And again, they were trying to push them to Eastern Europe, which is closer to them. They were trying to open factories there. But again, just to try to hold on to these revenue streams. Um, moving in the other direction on the supply chain, we, uh, we actually went, it turned out that Sundrum radiator caps for Dodge Ram pickups, they were, they went through a couple different tier one suppliers. So, and that's some of the ways that more auto manufacturers will operate. So what happened was, as Sundrum sent the cap to the United States, it didn't always, well, I don't know, never mind. It didn't always go from Sundrum to Modine, but it would go from Sundrum to Modine and to three or four other radiator manufacturers, and then all those radiators would go to different truck plants around the country. But um, the interesting part was that um, it, th we followed the track that went to Modine, Modine Radiator in Clinton, Tennessee, where they actually put together a cooling module. So what they did was they actually built the radiator, put all the stuff that goes attached to it, and then put that Sundrum radiator cap on it, and then shipped those off. Um, going after module assembly in a, is another way of, to be more valuable in the supply chain of the OEM. For instance, you know, if Modine can get the whole cooling system, and what we found was that these tier one suppliers were competing against each other. For instance, Modine makes a radiator. Someone else made a, a cooling or a pressure cooling, I don't know, that went onto the radiator. Those tier suppliers were competing with each other to say, wait, we can do the whole cooling assembly, so then give us all the work. And so Modine actually won out. So they were putting three other complete parts onto the radiator to make it a cooling system. But there's nothing to say that one of those other manufacturers couldn't have taken the Modine radiator and put the radiator on their cooling part and they would be the module builder. So, but again, this is another real competitive sort of give and take that tier one suppliers used to stay in the supply chain. Because they just had, to, you know, it was, a, it was a way to just bring more revenue in. So Modine had fought hard and had been doing radiators for, I think, the mid '70s, for lots of different people. Um, but um, what was interesting, the whole talking to Modine, the whole game changed. Burke and PCR in England had said, if Sundrum will talk to you, then we have no problem talking to you because we supply for them. So they opened their doors to us, and they were really great. They told us a lot of things off camera they didn't want on camera. But again, Sundrum was kind of like this anchor company that allowed us to start filming the supply chain. When we got to Modine, they said they couldn't do anything without Modine corporate H, uh, headquarter approval. Um, and Modine, when we talked to them in Racine, Wisconsin, they wouldn't even think about it unless they had approval from Chrysler. And this is where we caught kind of a break because Daimler, Daimler had just bought a controlling stake in Chrysler a couple of years earlier. And Chrysler wouldn't do anything unless Daimler agreed. Everybody was just like, no, it's got to go clear to the top. So Daimler, you know, we had kept going up the chain. We finally were talking to these guys in Germany about getting approval to shoot a radiator in Detroit, a uh, radiator in Clinton. And, uh, but Daimler Chrysler, the best thing about it was Daimler didn't suffer from this build America or American mindset. They saw themselves as a foreign company, a global company with a global footprint. And so they didn't have this sort of America first PR campaign that they were tied to like Ford did for the F-150. And I really think, and they didn't say it, but the way they, we operated and navigated through this approval process, because I think Daimler 
was just happy for publicity is publicity. It still feels like a fair show. We'll do it. We got approval from Daimler. And so once Daimler kicked in and said, yeah, you can do it, then Chrysler said, okay, fine. And then Modine said, okay, fine. But, I mean, Modine would do nothing to upset the OEM. They were, again, so nervous to upset Chrysler in this case that they wouldn't think about talking to us or letting us come in and film anything unless they got approval from the people that pays their bills. So it took a, another couple months of negotiating to figure it out. Um, the funny thing is, if you think of the Dodge Ram ad campaign at the time, though, it was kind of an American sort of phenomenon. If you think it's a, it was all based on that Hemi campaign, those two kind of white, blue-collar knuckleheads that were chasing the trucks around the country, and it's got a Hemi. So it's kind of portrayed the sort of American attitude, Hemi engine, lots of power, i.e., less fuel efficiency, who cares? We're just terrorizing around, the, you know, the American West. Wait, did I just say? Okay. Um, <clears throat> tearing it up in the vast openness of the American West. Sorry. Anyhow, um, yeah, that was sorry. Oh, sorry about that. Um, but once we got them on board, other suppliers <laughs> followed through as well. Like Arvin Meritor in Detroit all of a sudden opened their doors to us. So we were able to film a spring and shock module. The trouble is, at this point, we had spent, you know, we came into this film with a budget, and we sort of spent it all already. And, um, we didn't have the chance to go through. Our initial plan was to follow multiple supply lines. We had one supply line, and that's basically what we went with. We also identified, though, a lot of other supply lines. For instance, the frame was manufactured in Monterey, Mexico. The vaunted Hemi engine itself was put together in Satillo, Mexico, made with steel cast in Korea. So these supply chains, supply chains really came in from all over the place. Um, and while we... So it sort of the show started narrowing itself for us because we were had just sort of run out of options and you know run out of time. Um, we also, though, at the same time, did try to work with Honda and Toyota. We just tried that to the very end. Honda stayed with us longer and went through a series of negotiations. We thought we would be down in Alabama to talk about and show the Odyssey minivan plant, but it just never came through. Um, Again, I was really surprised at the control that the auto manufacturers have over their suppliers. And uh, we were constantly told off camera in, every, in nearly every case how difficult it was to operate with tremendous top-down pressure to cut costs and deliver component parts at lesser and lesser cost. And many of the suppliers felt that they were really being squeezed into bankruptcy or out of business by the, by the auto manufacturers themselves. What's interesting is you can see this whole thing is playing out now at an, almost a hyper rate. Um, if you go to the Wall Street Journal or probably the New York Times business in almost three or four days a week, you'll have an article about suppliers being squeezed by the auto manufacturers, especially now where they're applying for bailout money. They're trying to prove themselves viable. They've got to cut corner or cut costs all the way around from bondholders to workers, labor to, I mean, everything. And their suppliers, they just pass those reductions down to suppliers. Their suppliers' margins are already so thin. The last week, I think, th last week, I know that three suppliers declared bankruptcy here in America that supply for the big three. They just can't do business as usual. They just they don't make any money at all. Um, the final turning point in this film came with the fact that it took us so long to find companies that would work with us that we actually had other projects come along and we let this project sit. We, it didn't, like I said, it didn't take five years to make this film, but we let it sit for like a year at a time at two or three different occasions. The beauty of that, from my perspective, was that, you know, you always look at, I don't know, if you've written a paper and you go back five years later and you go, man, that paper, hmm, that could be better, or whatever. The same with the film, you look at your rough cut six months down the road and you go, well, that could be changed, or that could be better, this or that. Um, and I think seeing it with fresh eyes every six to eight months on two different occasions was really helpful for us. It also gave us a chance as well to track the automobile industry. I mean, if you think of the film Hoop Dreams, did anyone ever see Hoop Dreams when they were growing up? They followed these two kids in Chicago through high school, junior high into college. Their dream was to both play in the NBA. The great thing about that film was it was over like a six-year period. So you saw the development of these kids from 12, year, 12 years of age to 18. So you saw the two tracks of their lives, and one had met with more success than the other, and, and you see how they ended up. That's why that film was great, because you got to say, oh, I can't wait to see next year. We sort of had the same thing happen to us in this film, not with such a dramatic, I mean, degree, but when we, we in 2006 we got word, a year after we'd filmed everything, that, well, two things happened. One, we realized we didn't have any strong characters. If you look at this film, one of the hardest things about filming widgets, rubber and metal, that go into a bunch of widgets that make up a radiator cap that then stick on a radiator, then stick inside a truck, is that you're talking about just parts. It's not a very 
I mean, unless you're really into car manufacturing or really into globalization, I don't know if you would watch the whole show because, you know, how much rubber parts and metal parts can you look at? But so we really wanted to try to get some characters. We found a great character in India named Boniface, and we found another character uh, in Clinton, Tennessee, oops, named Therese. And in 2006, we went back and did another round of filming to get their stories. And Therese was great. She'd worked in the company for, at Modine for, she said it's basically half her life, but her whole entire life, basically. And I'm going to show you a trailer at the end here. But she talks about when she first started, the radiators would come off the assembly line, and she would cry every day because she had to, they would come off warped. They'd come out of the bake oven. So she, they had, gave her a two-by-four, and she'd beat them with a two-by-four so they'd flatten out. And that's how, that was radio technology when she started working there in the 70s. And Boniface, of course, is sort of the, he's emblematic of the winners in globalization. I mean, he is one of the higher paid upper middle class, he represents the higher paid upper middle class people in Chennai, India. He still makes substantially less than Therese makes in Tennessee. But his life on Indian standards is incredibly uh, uh, different than most of the people in that country. And so he's it's an immediate winner. Um, <clears throat> But then things happened, actually. Uh, by taking the extra time, we sort of watched firsthand what could happen. In 2006, while we were there, the plant manager, Brad Craze, told us that Modine, was gonna, Modine Radiator was closing down, that they were going to lose their radiators supply line, their first their tier one in the supply chain, because they were actually going to move Modine Radiator down to Mexico to save money. So what happened was Teresa and everybody else that worked there lost their job. In October of 2008, just five months ago, the last radiator rolled off the assembly line in Clinton, Tennessee. So again, having a four-year timeline sort of by, by accident, we were able to watch these things actually really play out and see a company that in 2005, Modine Radiator was like the, that was the Modine company of the year. And they have companies all over the world. 2006, they basically say when this contract runs out, you're gone. In 2008, it's gone. It's just a big vacant warehouse now just outside of Clinton, Tennessee, and all those jobs are gone and all that equipment's down in Mexico and they're building the same radiator for the same client but at a lesser cost per radiator. Um, I think what I'll do now is I'd like to just show you it's a two-minute trailer, one of the trailers we had to develop, and let's see if I can deal with this technology and make this work. Uh, DVD. Resume playback. Sure, should, the DVD should come up. It was on pause. There's probably not truly an American built car anymore. That's, that's all American. The car industry, uh, particularly, is a truly global industry. There are between 750 and 900 parts per vehicle, uh, and they truly come from all over the globe. Materials that are coming from North America or the Far East in Europe. Shelbyville, Tennessee, China, Russia, India, or the Eastern Bloc countries. Just where the components come from doesn't really matter. The profit and the direction comes from someplace else. Yes, I like very much my job. Makes a good salary, and uh, Good job. Seventeen years in, in terms of business. The cores were coming off to the other. They were warped. And all I had was a two before. I had to beat them with a two before. I've been there since I was 19 years old. <laughs> Almost half my life, I guess. Yeah, it makes me mad. Uh, you know, you got to compete with like Mexico and stuff like that. I don't understand that part. But I just hate it's happening to us. Everybody's competing with everybody. By looking at one vehicle, the Dodge Ram pickup, and tracing the origins of its component parts from all over the world, a symbol of the world economy appears and it's in your garage.
All right, pulled that off. Making the technology transition, not very good, those kind of things. Anyhow, um, that's the trailer we developed that we send out to the different PBS stations that we target for this program. Uh, there's a lot of things I could talk about, but I kind of hope that there might be some questions and discussion on either the film process or the concept of globalization itself or working with the automobile industry. So I'd kind of like to open it up a little bit, if that's possible. Does anybody, yeah? It sounded pretty. You sounded pretty loud to me. So. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I'll restate the question if I if we can hear. Okay, so the question is about labor unions and how do they relate or compete to wages overseas. Well, actually, the, the interesting thing about this is there's also a bit of a demographic shift here in the United States. In fact, Tennessee is a right-to-work state. So there is a union at the Modi, there was a union at the Modi and Radiator factory there, but they're also, you didn't have to be a member of the union to work at Modi and Radiator. Um, there's no United Auto Workers Union. There's not, they're not strong. And so what you've seen is there's been a reshifting of the automobile industry in the United States to the southern states, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, they've actually really gone after and tried to lure automobile manufacturers and suppliers down to the southern United States because the wages are a bit lower, but more than the wages, the legacy costs are nowhere near as high. There's no such thing as you get laid off and you get 90 percent of your salary for the year that you're laid off. Um, the, obviously, and again, it's, you know, the American auto, United Auto Workers and the they probably have a better labor deal than most Americans get, actually, in this time, you know, most working Americans. But um, there's been a big shift, like Honda Odyssey, they do, they, and Mercedes, they've all opened brand new plants in Alabama recently. And a big reason is because they don't have to deal with unions and the labor costs. And there's land available, and it's, uh, it's just cheaper operating expenses. But there is a big shift from the Rust Belt down to the south. I mean, automobile manufacturing in the southern United States is thriving. In fact, one of the big debates now, we've, we've, you know, if you pay attention to it, is this debate whether the, excuse me, the car company should be allowed to go bankrupt. And part of this debate is what will happen to all those out-of-work auto, out work auto workers. And a lot of people are saying, some industry experts are saying, well, if they're willing to relocate, there's plenty of automobile manufacturing jobs in the U.S. They will just have to move to the south because it's booming down there. Of course, nothing's booming in the automobile industry right this, you know, the last few months, but overall. So I don't know if that answered your question, but that is a tough question because if you hold on to high rates and, and uh, lots of benefits, it's great while it lasts, but if you can't compete and your company goes under because you've lost all the labor, I mean, you've lost it to cheap labor overseas, then it was good while it lasted, but now you just, I don't know. Is it better to try to go down and become more equitable or, you know, more, you know, in the same area or uh, range or not. I don't know if that's that's a question that gets asked and played out every day across industry. Yeah. What would you say your goal? Oh, <clears throat> I guess they do have a mic now. Okay. What would you say your goal or objective is in creating a film? What do you want? What's your desired uh, goal? Well, and Corey may want to talk to this too, uh, or Jeff, but I think, you know, we wanted to, the initial goal was to have something that was about globalization that we felt people could relate to. Because I've read a lot of academic papers, I'm sure you have too, and some of them just aren't that interesting. But they're full of relevant and pers uh, important information. We thought everybody here drives a car or has or owns one. And so if they could understand that that car is an emblem of the battle of globalization, it might be more personal to them. before you started the film and how over the course of the film um, your experiences um, changed your views or what added insights you gained into globalization? Hmm. <clears throat> well, uh, my views toward globalization, have they changed? Well, I feel like, one, I, I'm a lot smarter to the topic, so I, I'm, I'm better read, so I think I have a deeper understanding of globalization. Uh, and so that allows me, I think, to think about this issue critically than more so than before. I mean, but I mean, I go back and forth. I mean, if I, 
was building cars or if I was a blue collar worker in Detroit, I would want to be in the United Auto Workers because they have the benefits and things that a lot of other people don't. Um, I run a small business and it's it's impossible for me to uh, um, give my employees the same benefits and the same packages. So I sort of see firsthand, in my opinion, I see firsthand this sort of like tug of war between all these things. Um, I'm happy for guys like Boniface and different people in the developing world, and I have a lot of other a longer background in political science and things that make me ask the questions like, is a, is a economically stable world a better world as far as like risk and conflict? And so I, I'm all for the elevating of everyone to a certain level. But it's interesting, and we heard this come up actually in the arguments about globalization, and, and that was that eventually, if you think about it, an equilibrium would sooner or later develop where labor rates should be the same around the world. Or they would vary, but they would vary 5, 10 percent, not 700 percent or 800 percent. It's just a matter of time. And we've actually seen this being played out in Eastern Europe right now, is that when Eastern Europe opened up, when the European Union, for, you know, when they became, some of the states became part of the European Union, and even when they weren't, when they opened up their trade barriers and labor restrictions, people rushed into Eastern Europe because the rates were like a quarter of what they were in England, France, and Germany. And as the rate started, as the standard of living increased and development increased, the rates in Eastern Europe went up and up and up. So pretty soon there was a sort of a parity between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. And now, and the, the flip side was true too. You saw a lot of people like, gosh, when I was in England in 2005, everybody in every hotel and restaurant was from Poland or the Czech Republic or from, the, uh, from Bratislava, um, from Slovakia. And what we see now is mass migrations of these workers back. Eastern Europe because the rates have leveled out to a point where they may not be the same as in England. England's have dropped, the UK's have dropped, but theirs have also raised. And that will play out all over the world. The manufacturing is really cheap in China and India right now, but it gets more expensive every day. So I don't know. It's, it's one of those, I don't know, one of those things we talked about a lot with all the people. I don't know. You know, I think about it every day and I don't know if I've come up with any conclusion except I, globalization feels inevitable to me. I mean, we live in a global world. I'm not an isolationist by any stretch. I don't think you can just turn it off. Um, it's kind of going to happen. Technology has sort of set the framework. It's just easy to do business now globally all the time. So I probably didn't answer your question. I apologize. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, <clears throat> what kind of forces do you think are keeping these assembly plants in the United States? And do you think you mean the assembly plants, like, from the big three? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, and unfortunately, as we can see now in the testimony before Congress and everything, I mean, the automobile industry, okay, there's a couple things here. It's hugely political. I mean, there are huge political forces at work when it comes to the automobile industry, and part of that is because the automobile accounts for, and I think I'm probably going to get this wrong, something like 26% of manufacturing revenue or is it, gross domestic product in the U.S. comes from the sale, the make and sale of automobiles. If you think about large ticket, I mean, you think about consumer spending, what do you spend your money on? The biggest product, or the biggest thing would be your house. The next biggest thing might be education, but most likely you will spend more on automobiles over the course of your life than anything else. It's a big ticket item that funds communities. I mean, one of the biggest problems with all the dealerships closing down around the country now is that these dealers generated so much tax base that they're having to shut down schools and highway projects and all kinds of local things that depended on these dealers selling X number of cars to get huge amounts of tax revenue because just the basis, I mean, you're not, you know, every, the average car, I don't know what is it, $22,000 for the average car, maybe it's more now. So there's huge forces at work and it's the largest driver of our consumer economy. So unfortunately, I can't see where the big three would move overseas, but they are moving more. I mean, they've already moved so many things overseas. I mean, one of the things we also found out, and I was looking through my journal notes the other day, and it seems really relevant now again, was that we had in a discussion with the guys from uh, Modine was this talk of oversaturation in the market. I mean, there's just a lot of car companies and a lot of cars available to buy. And on a global level, they said, well, it'll be okay, it'll be absorbed by China. Well, that's true if your cars are made in China for the Chinese market or shipped to China for the Chinese market because they estimated they could buy 10 million cars a year for 50 years and still be behind the curb. But we're kind of at a saturation point in this market. And every new player that enters in, when Toyota opened the truck plant outside of San Antonio, that was a huge challenge to Ford, GM, and, and Dodge for the truck industry there. 
again, I don't have a definitive yes, no answer to any of these questions, but that's just my, I don't know. There's so many forces at work. Lee. so that there's not all of this expense <coughs> for um, transporting goods. Do you see that this could ever happen in the global markets that they would become more localized in? Yes, actually that did start to happen. I'm glad you brought that up. In 2006, or 2007, 2008, 2008 especially, as, transport, as fuel prices went up, transportation costs went up remarkably. And there was numerous stories where they were looking to replace their foreign suppliers with local suppliers purely because the cost of delivering the item finally reached the point where it was cheaper to make it at home. But then as fuel dropped off the ledge, that's not an issue again. So you know, we talk about well, there's so many forces involved here, and there's globalization in every industry, and all these industries are interrelated, but that's exactly right. There was all, there's always been that talk of as transportation costs go up, there's less incentive to make your part in Mexico because you still pay the same by the time you ship it up. But one of the other things that I found is interesting is that Sundrum uses BERC and PCR, and we asked them why, and it's in the film. They said because it's tooled up. The tools are already existing. In other words, they felt like the time and the effort it would take, because basically Sundrum could steal BERC and PCR and they could wipe them right off the supply chain. And I think it's frankly only a matter of time before somebody in India or China will make those little rubber washers that go into the radiator the radiator cap. But the fact that it was already there, established and tooled up, and there's long lead times, there was just really no incentive at this point to move it yet. They had a good relationship with the supplier. Everybody, well, Sundrum was making money, so they were happy with that. But there was kind of this sort of writing on the wall that, yeah, we could take that business if we really, truly needed it. But again, as you play the transportation costs and the fluctuating transportation costs, it will play into your cost for final delivery, which is factored in. But again, they know one factor that oil and gas would drop off like it did either, you know, and so they're just kind of caught running around to that. <clears throat> That's a very good point. So, anything else? Anything else you guys want to talk about? Yeah. Oh, the mic. You're pretty on the spot with that mic. <laughs> Um, so you have kind of these two stories here. Um, Teresa loses her job. Mm -hmm. um, her lifestyle kind of goes out the window, at least as she knows it. One of these benefits from it. Um, he gets a job. Um, and you kind of have these, I don't know, different arguments that in America, because of all the jobs there, you really need to protect your own jobs. Um, but on the other side, globalization offers more jobs to people who live in poverty or whatnot. But then other people argue, well, labor exploitation we have here, the big three demanding lower prices from their suppliers, so down the chain, they're making less and less. What, in seeing these two different stories, um, and kind of getting those different perspectives, what was kind of your response to it? That makes sense. <laughs> Well, my, I think if you ask me on any given day, it would change. Um, it's a complicated issue, and, you know, I felt a lot of – I felt happy for Boniface, obviously, and a lot of sympathy for Therese. Um, at the same time, I guess I'm a realist if I can say that and if I can apply that to this. Uh, I don't know – you know, if it's if it's numbers driven, if you have to make a product, and you know, especially public companies that appeal to shareholders and all, and again, you have lots of different factors in here. You have to make money to stay in in business for one. And um, I don't know. I don't know where fair balance is on this. Uh, is if anything, it's been more thought provoking. I don't think I've actually answered any question that I started with. This, you know, when I started this process. In fact, I, I probably. It raised many more questions of which I, it's just more of a thought process. You know, it's sort of ongoing for me. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, what do you think about? Yeah, no, I, I don't know. It's, uh, 
Yeah, it's 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 interesting, and I hate to use the word interesting because that trivializes it for people whose real lives are affected by it for sure. Um, it's hard. I mean, you know, original idea again. We had so many original ideas when we went into making this this film. One of the original ideas was we'd show a Detroit auto worker. We could not find one that would talk to us. It was still working, but we wanted someone who was still working. We knew we would get a you know a disgruntled employee who had been fired or whatever. But we set up times. We met at bars where we were supposed to meet all these guys where they went out and did whatever they did after they you know, clocked out. And every time they just disappeared or wouldn't follow through, they were just afraid of anything that might cause them to lose their job or speak out you know, against it. They felt like, I felt like bad if they were under a lot of pressure. I mean, and look at Detroit. I mean, what the numbers came out, what, this week? The average home sells for $18,500 in the Detroit metropolitan area. That's crazy. I mean, the whole city's tanking. But I, I don't know. So, yes. What do you think, in your opinion, the uh, what do you think, in your opinion, the, the American economy or American auto workers or suppliers can do to become competitive in the global market again? Uh, well, okay. Personal opinion, I think they can <laughs> pare down the numbers of vehicles they produce to the ones that you know their their core businesses. I mean, but again, these are like judging. It's hard to know. I mean, no one felt like the Hemi, the Dodge, that whole Hemi campaign, the fact that Dodge could sell all those trucks with a, just a complete gas guzzler in 2005, 6, and 7 was kind of staggering. I read a lot of reports. People thought that will not work. But they sold those things. That was their best-selling vehicle. I mean, they flew off because it just appealed to people, and those who needed a truck needed a truck, and they didn't care. Um, that kind of goes against what I would have thought conventional wisdom. So I think it's hard for the car companies to actually gauge ahead what will happen. And then they look at the market swings. You know, gas was $4 a gallon, and now it's $1.60. No one could have anticipated that. I mean, I love it when I hear conspiracy theories, how all the oil companies the car companies are in it to get us all. Yeah, right. I mean, they're like tearing each other apart. I, but they can't anticipate those kind of things. So, I mean, in general, they've always got to just try to do the best to keep costs down, which is why you've seen every automobile. The big three have lots of plants overseas. And everybody that we talk to, Modine, all the other companies based in America, they all have plants overseas. And so what they're doing is they may have a higher labor rate in Clinton and a lower labor rate in Mexico, but the average labor rate, the cost basis, maybe gets them close. So maybe it's not so much <clears throat> Well, it's not that they don't understand it like they're not qualified to understand it. It's just that the market's always shifting, and um, in my opinion. And you've got to, and with trade barriers going down all over the world um, in lots of different air arenas, you know, the car company's up for grabs. I mean, we heard over and over the last great place to make money is going to be China. Now, of course, China has really leveled off in its consumer consumption and its develop. You know, it's not on pace anymore. Um, but they may be, may be at that, but because of that, Jeep, Chrysler, Volkswagen, Mercedes, they're all in China, all developing plants, all working under the Chinese rules, uh, uh, government rules to develop those plants. But what we've seen already is that they have to basically share all the technology. It can't just be a manufacturing dump. And because of the regulations, they have to share the technology. And so what's happening is Chinese companies have basically pirated or co-opted or re-engineered the technology, and they're already coming out now with their own things based on technology they got from Volkswagen and Mercedes, some of the early players like a decade ago. And there'll be a time when you won't need a U.S. or a Western partner in China to make a Chinese automobile. And then besides that, China will try to, you know, we've been talking about a Chinese automobile in the United States for uh, about half a decade now. And it was probably getting really close, and then this whole implosion in the industry will probably backtrack that five years. Because what will happen is the whole thing will shake out the weaker partners, in my opinion, and new ones will come in. But I don't know. It's a tough topic. I mean, believe me, you can't just, you know. But I appreciate the discussion. I appreciate your attendance. And if anyone wants to say that, talk about it afterwards, I'm right here. So thank you.